Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. We're going to be starting off in the book of Matthew. If you want to follow along with us, we are in a series on the Beatitudes this morning, or the blessing statements of Jesus. Matthew West. Matthew West sang that song? There you go. Tie in. <laughs> All right. Well, and that, that song is a perfect uh, tie in to, to this message on you know, forgiveness. Um, who, who does not love to be forgiven when they have messed up, right? I think it's something that all of us hope for when, when we've made some kind of mistake, when we've, um, when we've made an error in some way. We hope that we can be forgiven, but it's not always, it's not always a, an automatic. It's not a guarantee. Um, there was one time when I was a kid, uh, I was outside, I was uh, messing around with like a stick, and I accidentally threw it through the window of our house and broke the window. And my dad and I were the only ones home, and I think, you know, I knew he was taking a nap in the bedroom, and so I'm thinking, okay, I've got a couple of minutes maybe to try to fix this before my dad finds out, and nobody has to know that I broke the window. And so, of course, I try, you know, to fix the window, but I quickly realized you can't, you can't fix broken glass. There's nothing that I can do. It's not like I've got a sheet of glass lying around that I can replace this thing with. And so I quickly realized I have no choice. I've got to fess up. I've got to go and tell my dad what happened. And so I opened the bedroom door, and my dad's sitting there. I'm like, hey, uh, Dad, I, I just broke a window. And he's like, I know. I'm like, you know? And he's like, yeah, I was just waiting to see how long it was going to take you to tell me. <laughs> and I was fully expecting my dad to just kind of fly off the handle, get angry. I mean, it was a careless mistake that I had made. I should have known better. I shouldn't have done it. But instead, he used it as a teaching opportunity, and he showed me forgiveness. He showed mercy. And it is such a good feeling when that happens. It's just such an overwhelming sense of relief when you have messed up, you have done something you shouldn't have done, maybe something you knew you shouldn't have done, maybe you did it on purpose, but the person that you wronged decides to extend mercy and say, I'm going to withhold consequences from you. I'm not going to hold this against you. It's, It's the greatest feeling in the world. But at the same time, even though we all want mercy when we have been the one to do something wrong, we often don't want mercy for somebody who has wronged us. You know, we want mercy for ourselves. We want judgment for other people. And so uh, maybe, you have, maybe you've been in that situation before, like you're driving down the highway and a car goes past you like going 20, 30, 40 miles an hour over the speed limit. They almost clip you as they fly by. And what do you do? You immediately are hoping, oh, I hope there's a police officer around the corner. I just can't wait to see this guy get pulled over, right? Or or maybe uh, you you went through a difficulty in a relationship, maybe a bad breakup, or you and a friend had a falling out with each other, and there's a part of you that just sort of relishes in the idea of them struggling in their next relationship or or, uh, going through some kind of difficulty further down the road. Uh, Maybe in a job you got passed over for a promotion or a place didn't hire you that you wanted to hire you, and so you you hope secretly that the person that got that position will fail so that it will prove that, you know, you you were the right one all along. You know, these are feelings that all of us can relate to, that that, um, desire to not extend mercy, to see somebody get what they deserve uh, when they have wronged you somehow. Wendy, I'm having trouble with the PowerPoint thing, so if you could, or the projector, so if you could click through the slides for me, thank you. (laughs) Um, We all want mercy for ourselves, but often struggle to extend it to other people. But here's the thing is that Jesus wants followers who show mercy. Jesus wants followers who are more concerned about the mercy they can give than the mercy that they receive. And we find this in in the next blessing, the fifth beatitude, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This begs the question, what is mercy? It's such a simple statement, but what is mercy? Usually the, the simplest definition of mercy is when you don't get something that you deserve. When you don't get something bad, I should say, that you deserve. You have committed some kind of sin. You have wronged somebody. You deserve consequences, but those consequences are withheld from you. Instead, you are offered forgiveness, like we were just singing about. You're offered a second chance. That's the typical definition of mercy. And in our society, often mercy is associated with legality or with an authority figure extending mercy to somebody who is underneath them. 
So a judge could decide to show mercy to someone in their courtroom. Maybe a person's found guilty of a crime, but when it comes to the sentencing, the judge can say, I'm going to show mercy to you. The person might even say, Your Honor, I throw myself at the mercy of the court. You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, a request to have the consequences lightened or withheld somehow. Or a parent can show mercy to their child, like my dad did to me in that story that I was sharing. A parent can say, I know you have, have done this thing that was wrong. I should ground you. I should punish you somehow. But I'm going to show mercy. I'm going to ease up on the consequences. Or I'm, I'm not going to extend any consequences at all. That's typically when mercy is shown, when there's an authority figure that can, that can extend or with, sorry, withhold consequences from someone underneath them. And so you might be thinking, well, what about situations where I'm not an authority? You know, this person's committed a crime. I'm not the judge, so I don't have any business showing mercy to them. Or, you know, it's not my kid. I, you know, it's not my place to show mercy. Or I'm not their boss. Or I'm not their superior. So I'm off the hook, right? I don't have to show any mercy. But the word that Jesus uses here in this statement it's, it goes deeper than just a, a legal definition or withholding consequences. The Greek word that Jesus uses here for mercy is the word eleimones, eleimones, which doesn't just mean withholding consequences. Actually, it means to have compassion or mercy on a person in unhappy circumstances. The key word there is to have compassion. Mercy, as Jesus is defining it here, describing it, has to do with how we feel toward other people, not just with what we can tangibly do for other people. So you might think, I'm not a judge, or I'm not a parent, or I'm not a boss, or I'm not in the authority. I don't have the power to withhold consequences. That's all right. We don't all have the power to withhold a deserved consequence from someone, but all of us have the capacity to have compassion on somebody else who is going through a difficult circumstance, particularly a difficulty of their own making. This person has sinned. They have done something wrong. They have, uh, they have broken the rules. They deserve a consequence, but yet we can still show compassion. We can still wish good things for them. We can still want to see their consequence diminished so that they can try to make a better choice the next time. Mercy has to do with how we feel toward other people. It's wanting good for the other person, even when they don't necessarily deserve it. And even if there's nothing that we can tangibly do to remove the bad circumstances that we're in, we can still have a compassionate heart toward other people. And Jesus indicates in that statement that there is a connection between the mercy that we give and the mercy that we might receive. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. See, again, we all want mercy for ourselves. We all want to be shown mercy. But Jesus is saying it's the people who show it themselves that are going to receive it. We have to want mercy for other people, not just for ourselves. If you go to the Old Testament, uh, if you were to do a a word search in a a Bible app uh, for the word mercy, there are all sorts of examples of God's people asking God for mercy. They've sinned, they've disobeyed him, they have rebelled against God. And so over and over again, God's people are begging for mercy. If you go through the Psalms alone, you find just dozens of examples of God's people crying out to God for mercy. Psalm 4.1, answer me when I call you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Psalm 6. 1 and 2, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. Who's ever felt like this before? Both of these examples, this person has obviously done something wrong. They, They have deserved some kind of consequence. And we've all been there. We've all sinned and we've all suffered consequences from our sins. But yet cry out to God and say, God, just rescue me. Deliver me. Help me. We've all been there before. We've all done things that we wish we hadn't, and we're just asking God for another chance. And sometimes we receive that mercy, and sometimes it feels like it falls short. And the question is, why, why do we sometimes not receive mercy? Well, if we fast forward a little bit in the Old Testament to the book of Zechariah, toward the end in the, the book's called The Minor Prophets, the former pastor of mine used to say, the part of your Bible where the pages stick together just before you get to Matthew, the book of Zechariah, it's a, 
a prophet who is writing to the Israelites after they've been exiled, and they've spent about 70 years in exile. They've been taken away from their home. They are suffering the consequences of their sins, of their disobedience to God, of their rebellion against God. And now they're waiting to be delivered and rescued. And they're, they're pleading with God for that rescue, but there seems to be some degree where they don't quite get it yet. They're asking God for mercy, and yet they still haven't experienced it. And so in Zechariah 7, starting in verse 8, we read, And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. And he defines a little bit of what that looks like. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. So God is saying, you, you're crying out for mercy. And actually in the passage just before this, they are they're fasting and they're praying and they're worshiping and they're wondering, God, why is it that even though we're worshiping you, we're fasting, we're praying, our prayers haven't been answered. We haven't been delivered yet. And God's saying, all right, here's the deal. You might be worshiping me with your mouths, but I asked you to show mercy to each other. I asked you to have compassion on each other. But what happens? Verse 11, but they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they, tr- they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words of the Lord Almighty had, had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> they, God was not listening to them. God was not answering their cries for mercy because they had not obeyed him in extending mercy to other people. That's what Jesus is talking about. There's a connection between the mercy that we receive and the mercy that we are willing to give. We can cry out to God for mercy, but how concerned are we with the mercy that we are extending to others? There's a great example of this later on in the book of Matthew chapter 18. If you want to follow along, Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 through 35, it's often called the parable of the unmerciful servant. I'll just paraphrase for you. First of all, Peter goes to Jesus and he asks him, how many times do I need to forgive somebody if they sin against me? What, seven times? You know, Peter probably thought he's been really generous. You know, somebody comes to me and, and they've done something wrong. They ask me for forgiveness and I forgive them and then they do it again. You know, and I forgive them again. How many times should I keep this cycle going? You know, seven seems like a pretty good number. Is seven the limit on forgiveness? You know, and if you think about our culture today, Seven probably does seem like a huge number of times to forgive somebody. Because in our culture, you're likely to be canceled after one offense, right? You know, you, you could say something, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago and it resurfaces today and you're going to get in trouble for that, uh, you know, something that, that isn't even recent. So, of course, you know, if we were to offer forgiveness seven times, that, that seems awfully generous in this day and age. But Jesus goes on to say, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. He's giving such a a huge number on how many times you should repeat the cycle of offense and forgiveness that it almost seems absurd. He's basically saying there is no limit on how many times we should forgive somebody if they ask for it. And then he goes on to tell this parable. And he says that the kingdom of heaven is like this king who is settling up all of these debts that were outstanding against him. And he calls in this servant, and the servant owed just this massive debt. It says in uh, the NIV, it says he owed 10,000 bags of gold, or another word is talents. A talent is, is like years worth of wages. So basically, this, this guy owes just years, like lifetimes worth of, of, of a day laborer's wages. He owes so much money that there is no chance he could possibly work to earn enough money to pay this back. What what would be the equivalent today of of millions, if not billions of dollars that this man owes to the king? And so the king is calling him in to settle up the debt. He probably knows there's no way this guy can repay it. And the consequence then, if you can't pay the debt, is you go into this debtor's prison, this place that you go until the debt is repaid, which in this guy's case, it's going to be never. He's going to be in prison for for life. And so the man falls on his knees. He begs the king for mercy. And he he actually asks for more time. He doesn't even ask for the debt to be forgiven. He says, give me more time to repay the debt so that I can avoid going into this prison. But it says that the king had mercy on him. And and it says that the king not only gave him mercy that he offered more time, the king actually forgave the entire debt. 
He said, you don't owe me anything anymore. He, he took this massive debt that, that, that could not be repaid in a lifetime's worth of work, and he said, it's forgiven. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And so the servant leaves, and he's off the hook. He doesn't owe money anymore. He, he's not under threat of getting thrown into prison anymore. He's probably breathing a huge sigh of relief, as I'm sure all of us would. That's, that's what any of us would want in that situation, just to be forgiven. But then he comes across another servant who owed him a small sum of money in comparison. It says he owed him a few hundred silver coins, which is a, 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 the, the amount of money that a day laborer would make in a day. So he, he, he owes maybe a couple months worth of work. You know, still not, a, not nothing, not a tiny amount of money, but in comparison, it's, it's infinity apart, right? He, he owes a fraction of what this, this first servant had owed to the king. And so what do you think he's going to do? You know, well, hey, the king forgave me, so I'm going to forgive this guy? No, he, he does the opposite. He says that he grabs this guy by the neck, he starts choking him, and he's demanding that this man pay him back this much smaller sum of money. And when the man can't do it and the man begs for mercy, this other servant, he has him thrown into that debtor's prison that he had just narrowly avoided getting thrown into himself. When the other servants hear about this, it says they're outraged. They're furious that, that this man who has shown such incredible mercy would turn around and not show mercy to someone else. And so then word of this gets back to the king. And so the king is furious. And he calls this man back in. And he says, look, I just showed you this, this incredible amount of mercy and forgiveness. And what do you do? You turn around and you, you don't show that same mercy to someone else. And so the king revokes his offer of mercy. And he has the man thrown into prison. And Jesus ends by saying, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. See, Jesus began this by saying that this, this describes the kingdom of heaven. The king is like God, and we are like that servant. And all of us owe a massive debt to God, a debt that we could not possibly repay, a debt that was created by our sins. Every single one of us has broken God's rules or God's law at some point in our lives. And that creates a debt that we cannot repay. We can't work hard enough to pay it back. We could do good deeds from now until the end of our lives, and we will never do enough good things to repay the debt that we are in to God. But just like the king, God extends mercy to us. We're told in the book of John, chapter 3, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, a lot of times we stop there, and that's the only verse we read, or that might be the only one that we had memorized. But the question is, why would anybody perish? You know, what, what's, what's going on here? Like, why did God have to do something? Why did he have to send his son so that no one would perish? Well, the rest, the next few verses explains that. If you continue on, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, we're already in a position where we need saving. Keep going. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. This is the key. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. See, that's the position all of us find ourselves in, like that servant owing this massive debt. We already are condemned because of our sins. We already deserve consequences for the, the wrong things that we have done. Apart from God showing us mercy, we all deserve death and hell. But God loves us so much that instead of giving, letting us fall into that consequence, letting us accept what we have brought upon ourselves, he offers us mercy and forgiveness. This is what the gospel is all about. This is the good news that Jesus came into the world, the perfect son of God, to take the punishment that we deserve by dying on the cross and to defeat death by raising again from the dead. And all we have to do is believe in him. We trust our life to him and we can receive that mercy that he offers. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can't pay the debt back, but we can freely accept the offer that Jesus is giving through, the death, through his death on the cross. But here's the thing is that there becomes an expectation then that once we have received this, we extend that same mercy to other people. See, again, in our world, people want mercy for themselves, but they want judgment for other people. But what Jesus is basically saying is that he wants followers who are concerned about mercy. 
We should not be like the rest of the world. Once you have received the mercy that Jesus offers, you now need to offer it to other people, and you should want it for everybody. Our response to this gospel message that God sent his son into the world to die for us should be this deep desire that everybody else in the world hears and understands that message and receives the same mercy that we have received. That's what you would expect reading the story of the unmerciful servant, that when he goes out from there, he would show mercy to other people. But instead, he, he doesn't do that. You know, it makes me think of the, the story, A Christmas Carol. It's one of the most famous stories, Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. Anybody ever read the book or seen the movie? I grew up in the 80s, so my first exposure was the Disney version, Mickey's Christmas Carol. Anybody see this one when they were kids? All right, we've got a few. All right, so the story is, uh, is that there's this, uh, this old man, Ebenezer Scrooge, this, this mean, you know, business tyrant who um, is just cruel to everyone uh, that he comes across, especially Bob Cratchit, his, his employee. And, and all he's concerned with is, is his wealth, is making money. And despite any opportunities he has to be generous or helpful to other people, he turns all of that down. And so he is visited by the ghost of his former partner, Marley, who shows up and says, tonight you're going to be visited by three ghosts this Christmas Eve. You're going to meet the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, the ghost of Christmas future, and basically they are going to show you the error of your ways. And so throughout the course of the rest of the story, Ebenezer Scrooge, or Scrooge McDuck in the Disney version, <laughs> is visited by these ghosts, and he sees how, how the, the, cruel, the cruelty that he showed to others, the lack of compassion, the lack of mercy, it's actually... Uh, dis really destroyed his life, even though he's made all of this wealth, it has distanced him, alienated him from his friends, from people that would have loved him. And ultimately, it's going to lead not only to his death, but to the death of other people as well, because he could have shown generosity and compassion, and he chose not to. And so, as he is being visited by this final ghost, and he's, he is just terrified by what his future holds for him, he's crying out for mercy, and then finally he wakes up, and he realizes that it that it, it hasn't actually happened yet, and he has another chance. And he is immediately transformed. He goes out, he gets dressed, he, he starts giving away money, he's showing generosity to everybody that he encounters, especially to people who earlier in the story he had been cruel to. Uh, and then he goes to the home of his employee, Bob Cratchit, he makes him a huge dinner for Christmas, and he offers him a, a pay raise, and he, he basically vows to be a different person. And what you see is that when he recognizes this mercy that he has been given, that, that his future is not set, that he doesn't have to face these consequences that these ghosts said that he's going to be facing, the, tri the, the immediate reaction is to show that same mercy to everybody else. And this is, an, this is a picture, really, an illustration of what all of us should do when we receive mercy. When we receive the gospel, when we are given forgiveness by God, our response should be not like the unmerciful servant in Matthew, but should be like Ebenezer Scrooge. We should go out and try to show that mercy to as many people as we can. That's what the gospel is intended to do, to transform us and to make us into these merciful people. The, the Beatitudes, these statements of Jesus, they're not a list of how you get saved. It's not do these things and God will save you. Rather, this is describing a person who has been transformed by Jesus. This is what we should be starting to look like as we become followers of him. Charles Spurgeon called the Beatitudes a ladder of light. He said that each one builds, uh, builds on and out of the one that came before it. So we, we started with blessed are the poor in spirit. We recognize that I offer nothing to my salvation. I am totally at God's mercy. And then we move on to um, blessed are those who mourn, and we talked about how it particularly means those who mourn over their sin and over their wrongs. And we recognize that, that um, this has created this massive debt, and so it brings about this sadness. But then we also learn meekness. Blessed are the meek. We, we trust God, not ourselves, to fight our battles for us. And then last time we talked about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So as we start, as our, our character starts to change, we should long to replace that sin and that brokenness and that poverty of spirit with God's righteousness, doing what God calls us to do. Now, it's been said that uh, the, just like the Ten Commandments, the first few Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship to God, and then the final commandments have to do with our relationship to others. It's been said the Beatitudes are the same. These first, um, these first four Beatitudes, they really describe our relationship with God. 
But out of that then, as Spurgeon said, the, the ladder is going up and out, the next Beatitudes begin to describe our relationship toward others. When God has done this work in you, of taking your, your poor and broken spirit, offering forgiveness for your sins, and developing this sense of meekness, and developing this hunger and thirst for righteousness, it now should start to translate into how we interact with other people, and how we view other people. And particularly, we should have compassion for other people. But here's the problem. Sometimes Christians aren't very merciful. See, again, Jesus wants followers who are more concerned about the mercy they can give than the mercy that they can get, but sometimes we're just not that merciful. And, and part of this, I think, is that we live in an unmerciful world. You know, we talked about that a few moments ago, that in this world, if you, uh, it's not three strikes, you're out. It's usually one strike and you're out. If you wrong me, you're dead to me. You know, and, and that's how the world at large tends to treat people. You know, if you, if you uh, just uh, Google examples of people being canceled in 2022 alone, you're going to find all sorts of celebrities or politicians or people in the spotlight who, who uh, made one wrong statement or did one wrong thing, and suddenly their, their careers are over, their, their influence is gone. And it's not just celebrities, but it's, it's just our posture toward each other in this culture. There are so many dividing lines between people. And if somebody happens to be on the wrong side of that dividing line in this society, forget it, right? We don't want to offer that person our friendship. We don't want to work with that person. We don't want to have a relationship with that person. And our society is just geared right now to just dividing as much as we possibly can. Anybody on the outside is, is the other. They're in a different camp. We're not going to show them mercy. We're not going to show them forgiveness. That's how the world at large works. But Jesus is calling us to a different set of virtues. He call, he's calling us to a different character. Even if the rest of the world for, refuses to show mercy, Jesus' followers should be characterized by the mercy that we show to other people. You know, so you think of all those different dividing lines. And it's really, really easy to picture that person who has the opposite political views as you, the opposite social views that you have. They live a totally different lifestyle from what you live, and we, we caricature them. We, we paint the stereotype of them, and we excuse ourselves. We say it's okay to, to mock them, to belittle them, to, to write them off. You know, uh, may, maybe it is a, a politician or it's a celebrity and, and, you know, we just crack jokes about them. You know, we're never going to meet them anyway, right? So it's okay. We can crack jokes. We can, we can mock them. But we, we extend that then to the other people who hold those views. Maybe people that you work with. Maybe people you live next door to. Maybe family members. And, and we as Christians can be just as guilty of the rest of the world as building up those walls of division and writing off those other people. And instead of showing mercy and compassion toward them, we, we are cold and callous toward them. We, we joke around about them. If they suffer, we almost relish in that suffering. That's not how we should be. We should be people who want to extend grace and mercy. And the reason we should want to extend that is so that those people can experience the gospel, so that they can hear the truth about Jesus. See, having compassion on somebody doesn't mean that you ignore every sin that they've ever committed. It doesn't mean that you suddenly adopt all of their views or their lifestyle or their stances on different things. If they're suffering because of their sin, it doesn't mean that you, you don't want them to learn their lesson or you don't want them to, to grow because of it. But it does mean that you want what's good for them. And what is absolutely best for them is to know the truth about Jesus and to know that they can experience his mercy and forgiveness. And if as Christians, if we have these walls built up, how are we supposed to show that compassion? And how are we supposed to extend the gospel to people who are very different from us, who have different views and different beliefs and different attitudes and lifestyle? If they sense that hostility between us, they're never going to hear that message that we have to share. I think of the Apostle Paul himself, who started off as a Pharisee, who, who was adamantly opposed to God. And had, had God's people, had Jesus' followers thrown into prison and beaten and even killed for their faith. Do you think that Christians at that time viewed Paul as a threat? Absolutely they would have. They would have been terrified if they knew he was coming into their town because it means that he, they could have been arrested, they could have been killed, they could have been separated from their families. But what did God do? He blinded Paul on the road to Damascus. He stopped him. He, he transformed him by getting a hold of him and, and sharing 
the truth about Jesus with him, and Paul was radically transformed. And he went from killer of Christians to one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever known. And there were Christians in that time, we, as we learn from reading in Acts and some of Paul's letters, there were people who, who were still afraid of Paul and who weren't sure. They thought maybe he's just you know, putting on an act so that he can infiltrate and, and you know, take us down from the inside. But ultimately, more and more believers began to realize God has done this amazing work in Paul's life. And, and the same people who Paul was once persecuting are now rejoicing over the transformation that's been done. We should want that same transformation for everybody that we encounter out in the world, for all of those people that we stereotype, that we caricature, that, that we write off or joke about. Our desire should be to see them transformed by the gospel. Not to, to write them off as a lost cause or, or to distance from them or to build walls up, but we should want to extend mercy to them, have compassion for them, so that they can be transformed by the same thing that has transformed us. We need to remember the fact that we owed a massive debt to God ourselves that we couldn't repay, but Jesus and Jesus alone forgives. Again, Jesus wants followers who are more focused on the mercy they can give than the mercy that they get. And that song about forgiveness we talked about, it mentions how it, it can hurt our pride to forgive. You know, it, it's, it can sting a little bit to offer forgiveness, especially if that person wrongs us again. You know, shame on you, you fooled me yet again, over and over again. Or, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? It, it can hurt our pride. But we should be more concerned about building bridges for the gospel than we are with our pride. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36, Jesus is going out into the, into the crowds. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Jesus is going out and he's interacting with all these people who don't follow him yet. What's his posture toward them? Next verse. When, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The question that, that we should be asking ourselves is, do we want to see people the way that the rest of the world sees people? Or do we want to see people the way that Jesus sees people? The world looks at people and it, and it divides them up, it draws lines, it writes people off, it builds up walls. But Jesus looks at people, even sinful people, even people who have rejected him, and he has compassion because he recognizes that they are lost without him. And that's the, those are the eyes he wants us to look at the world with. Do we look at people with compassion or with contempt? If right now you're thinking, you know what, that, that might describe me. I could grow in my sense of mercy. I, I need to be more compassionate to people who are on the outside. Then, then here's a couple of, of, of just steps that I think we can take this morning. First of all, reflect on how much mercy God has shown you. And remember, remember, we are the unmerciful servant in Jesus' story. We all owed a massive, unpayable debt to God because of our sin. And God freely forgives it through the death and resurrection of Jesus. If he has done that for us, then shouldn't we be willing to extend mercy for the smaller, much smaller, infinitely smaller offenses that have been done against us? The more we are aware of our own sin, the more we can reflect on God's mercy. As, as sin increases, grace increases all the more. So I'm not saying reflect on your sin so you can feel bad about yourself, so you can wallow in self-pity, but reflect on your sin so you can recognize the awesomeness of God's grace that he extends to you that he still has hope for you, that he has given you another chance, that he has a plan for you. Despite all of that, he offers forgiveness. And here's the thing is, if you have never accepted that grace, if you're thinking, you know, I've, I've committed all of these sins, I've done all of these wrongs, I, I don't know that I've ever experienced God's mercy. He is freely offering it to you. All you have to do is believe in him. Just trust in him. Pray to him. Admit that you're a sinner. Admit you're you have done things that are wrong. Confess those things to him and ask for forgiveness and trust your life to him. That's all you have to do. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. I would love to talk with you more about that after the service if you've never experienced that mercy. If you have experienced that mercy, though, never forget what God has saved you from and the incredible depth of the, the grace and the mercy that he's extended to you. And then with that in mind, pray for an attitude of mercy toward other people. If you recognize that there is a little bit of bitterness or, or hardness of heart toward other people, maybe, maybe certain 
uh, demographics in our society or, or people who believe certain things or hold different certain political views or what, whatever, what, whatever it might be. Pray for your attitude toward those people. Pray that God would do a supernatural work here. We need the Holy Spirit to transform us. It's a supernatural work that happens, that transformation. And so we need to ask God to make it happen. Pray for the attitude that we have so that we can extend that mercy. And then finally, we need to be willing to do what Jesus did and develop friendships with people who need him. Jesus was called a friend of sinners, not because he approved of what sinners did, not because um, he, he joined in with them, but because he went to them where they were and he showed them mercy so that he could bring them to the next level, so he could show them forgiveness and help them to become his followers and get them to change and transform their lives. He had to meet them where they were, though. He didn't build up walls and say, jump over the wall and then you can be my follower. He went to where they were. He showed them forgiveness first. He developed friendships with them so that he could pull them along to the next step. And I think we can do the same thing. Now, now don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying, or, or I, I fully believe that our, our best, our closest friends should be people who share our faith, that are encouraging us and inspiring us in our walk with Jesus. That's why we have community groups or life groups. We want to get people together in community to share life with each other and to encourage each other and to read scripture together and pray together and, and we build each other up when we do this. But we also need to be friends to people outside of the church, people who need Jesus so that we can show that same grace that has been shown to us. We need to remember what it was like to, to be in their shoes, to be hopelessly lost, to owe this debt that we couldn't possibly pay back, but then to have God just freely offer to forgive us. So we need to do what Jesus did and be willing to be a friend of sinners. We can't look at people the way the world does, with, with contempt, with, with anger, with bitterness. We need to learn to see people the way that Jesus does. We need to be willing to show mercy and be more concerned with the mercy we give than the mercy that we get. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning that you are a God of grace and mercy. We are the ones that sinned against you. You could have turned your back against or on us, and you could have written us off, but instead you chose to offer us forgiveness by the death of Jesus. Through his, his death and resurrection, we can have life. I pray that everyone here would understand that message, that truth, would understand your gospel. I pray that we would all be transformed and radically changed by it. And instead of being like the unmerciful servant who was offered your forgiveness but then refused to show it to others, I pray that we would be people who extend mercy wherever we can so that the truth of your gospel can be known throughout this world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.